So what I want to know is how do we figure out that two people have the exact same sequence of DNA? What technologies exist that allow us to compare segments of DNA? So we're going to look at today DNA technology. Oopsies. So the first thing, um, I want you to kind of step into uh, your imagination zone and I want you to imagine that you are uh, a crime scene investigator and you're working in a forensics lab and there's been a crime where some woman was murdered and um, underneath her fingernails they find a little bit of skin that she like was able to scrape off her attacker or something like that. If you've ever watched CSI, it's a very common theme that they go with that they find skin cells underneath their fingernails. All right. Uh, so. Let's say there's 10 skin cells, and those 10 skin cells, uh, they contain DNA, of course, right? But the question is, how much DNA is in there? Can you see it with your eyes? Is it enough to test? No, you can't do anything with it at that point. It's 10 cells worth of DNA. That's like basically nothing, right? So the very first thing that you have to have in order to do anything with DNA is you have to have a DNA copy machine, right? It's just like a copy machine that you would have for making paper, uh, but instead it makes copies of DNA. And so um, that's what we're going to look at first is a, a process that's called the polymerase chain reaction that's going to allow us to make lots of copies of a sequence of DNA. It makes a bunch of copies of the those 10 DNA. Yep. Polymerase chain reaction is, uh, and it's normally abbreviated PCR, is a method for creating millions of copies of a sample of DNA. Is that valid? Oh, no, I just want to copying the cells entire or just the DNA? Just the DNA, okay? So what you do is you have this copy machine. The copy machine is called a thermocycler. And that is the machine that regulates temperature. PCR process. Okay, and in this machine, you're going to put your sample of DNA. You're going to put your um, some some free nucleotides, and then a couple of enzymes. Right. And so uh, the first step, step one in the process of using a thermocycler, is the thermocycler is going to heat up, and it heats up the sample enough to break hydrogen bonds. So the sample is heated enough to break hydrogen bonds um, so then if it's heated up enough to break hydrogen bonds what um, happens to the DNA what's the actual like result of that what in DNA is held together by hydrogen bonds the base pairs, the two strands are essentially held together, right? And so we know that if we heat it up enough to break the, the hydrogen bonds, that the two strands will separate, okay? And so this essentially does the job of what enzyme? What enzyme normally separates the two, one, the two uh, strands? Helicase, yeah. So this does the job of helicase. Now it actually does it better than helicase does because helicase is gonna make all those replication bubbles. This is just gonna separate the two strands completely. And the good news about that is that there's no leading strand and lagging strand then. They're both just gonna make the whole thing, right? And so you don't have to worry about having DNA ligase or DNA topoase or anything like that. They're just gonna separate everything from one another, okay? So uh, step two, you gotta cool it down. So the sample is cooled enough for base pairing to occur. With free
three nucleotides. Okay, so those free nucleotides that were floating around in there, they start the complementary base pair, and now you've got uh, essentially a copy of DNA, except for the fact that um, there's a problem, and that's that there's nothing in there that can create the sugar phosphate backbone. What enzyme is normally responsible for creating the sugar phosphate backbone? Joins the nucleotides together. Which one does that? Polymerase does that. Okay, DNA polymerase um, has a problem though, and that is if we heat the sample up enough to break hydrogen bonds, that enzyme gets totally messed up. It gets totally denatured. And so there's no way that you can put that enzyme in there. And so what we actually do is we use a very specific um, DNA polymerase that was extracted from a prokaryote that lives in hydrothermal vents. And it's called TAC polymerase. The um, prokaryote was called Thermus aquatus. Uh, because it lived in, in a hydrothermal vent. And so uh, we take that specific DNA uh, polymerase enzyme out of that prokaryote because it's resistant to denaturing at high temperatures. And then that allows us to then um, make this um, sugar phosphate backbone. So we can say that TAC polymerase is used to join nucleotides together. Because it will not denature at high temperatures. Okay, so um, let's say this process takes an hour. Okay, to go through step one through three here. Uh, and so let's say we start with just one segment of DNA. We throw that into the thermocycler. And so after an hour, there's two. Then after two hours, there's four. Four hours, eight, or uh, three hours, there's eight. Then 16, then 32, then 64, then 128, then 256, then 512, then 1028, right? You get the idea. And so uh, you can keep multiplying that by two and you repeat this for say 24 hours and you've got millions and millions of copies now of this DNA. You started out with 10 copies because there were 10 skin cells and now just using one or two of those skin cells, the samples from there, you now have millions of copies that you can go through and do lots of tests on, right? So question now becomes what tests are we going to do? Uh, and the tests are pretty much all the same and the first thing we need to do is um, be able to tell two sequences of DNA apart based on their orders. So we're going to use these things that are called restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are naturally occurring enzymes, uh, and they occur in uh, prokaryotes. They're essentially the way that a prokaryote can defend itself against viruses. And so they are these enzymes that are going to look for a specific sequence of DNA, and they're going to target that sequence of DNA, and they're going to cut it up. So all they do is they target DNA sequences that don't exist in their own chromosome. And then anytime foreign DNA from a virus gets injected into the cell, it might have that sequence. And so it gets cut up so that it doesn't infect the cell. Okay. So these are enzymes that target a specific sequence of DNA and cut the DNA at that sequence. Okay, so let's say we've got like sequence one here. Sequence one is G A T A C A G G. C A T or something like that. Okay, and then sequence two is like G A T T G G A C G G T or something like that. Okay. 
So two pretty different sequences of DNA here. There's been some mutations. There's been some point mutations and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but the key here, let's say that this specific um, restriction enzyme cuts at the GG combination. Anytime there's a GG, it's going to cut it up. All right. So that means that the top sequence gets cut right here and the bottom sequence gets cut right here and it gets cut right here. Okay. So the top sequence is going to turn into two segments, one that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven nucleotides in it, and the other one that has four, and the bottom one's going to get cut into um, three segments, one that has five, one that has four, and one that has two. Okay, so because these are different sequences, they get cut into different amounts of segments, right? And then now we just have to analyze those segments. So the way that we analyze those segments is using a process that's called DNA gel electrophoresis. And I know that sounds confusing, but it's really not all that confusing uh, when you look at it. So this process is going to use electrical current in order to separate DNA by um, the size of the segment. So it uses electrical current. You separate fragments of DNA by the size of the fragment. Okay, so um, the way that this works is uh, a, a concept that's in all physics, so uh, it's it's demonstrating it's it's able to be demonstrated in a lot of different ways. But one of the coolest ways that you can demonstrate it, and I think there's a couple YouTube videos of this. I didn't want to waste the time to, to watch them, but you can go and look at them if you want. If you take a piggy bank and you fill it up with all different kinds of coins, like let's say you put in 50 cent pieces and quarters and nickels and dimes and pennies, right? And you fill it up nice and good, and you take it and you chuck it at the ground really really hard. Okay, you try to put it straight down though, so all the energy is going straight down. Okay, what you'll see is the coins will spread out a bunch, right? They'll, they'll, they'll shatter and it'll go out in all different directions. But if you took the probabilities, like you made like a bullseye from the point where uh, the piggy bank got smashed, what you would see is furthest out, you would have a very high concentration of dimes. The next band in, you'd have a very high concentration of pennies. The next band in, you'd have a very high concentration of nickels, then quarters, then... Um, uh, 50 cent pieces, right? And the reason for that is that they are um, much lighter, that dimes are the lightest of all of them. And if you impart, impart the same amount of energy by smashing the whole thing on the ground, then that energy goes the furthest with a dime because it doesn't have as much mass to it. And it goes the least amount of distance with a 50 cent piece because it has the most mass to it, right? And so they separate themselves nice and, and evenly by their mass. The same thing's gonna happen in DNA gel electrophoresis. You're going to apply the same amount of energy to all the fragments, but the small fragments are going to move further than the, than the large fragments. So you take this stuff called agarose gel. This is a polymerized um, um, agarose gel here, and I'll, I'll actually run a gel for you tomorrow and pass this around so you can see. But um, you can see there's these little well plates, uh, or wells uh, rather at the end. And this is where you're going to insert your samples of DNA. Okay, so let's say that this is like the crime scene here. That's the stuff that you got from the crime scene. This is suspect number one, suspect number two, and suspect number three. Okay, so you load the DNA samples in there from your three suspects. Okay, and now you have to apply some force to it. And the force that you apply, like I said here, is you're using electrical current. So on one side, you put um, the negative electrode. The other side, you then you put the positive electrode. And then you just turn it on, okay? And because DNA has a negative charge, it's going to be attracted to the positive electrode and it's going to be repelled from the negative electrode, 
right? And so um, the samples will begin to move across this gel and they'll move across this gel based on how big they are. So the smallest fragments will end up up here. And the largest fragments will end up down here. Because that's where they started. And they're not going to travel very far. Okay, So let's say that our bands work out something like this. And then like this. So now we've got uh, we've got four different um, banding patterns on there, or four four banding pa patterns on there. And what we want to do is we want to compare them and say, okay, who done it? Who's our who's our guy? And so we go through and we say, okay, this matches this one and this one and this one. So all of those match. Then this matches this one and this one, right? This one matches this one, this one, this one. This one matches this one, this one, this one, this one. This one matches all of them. And all these match. So who's our guy? Number three is the only one that has all of their stuff that matches, right? And therefore we can say number three and the crime scene had the exact same sequence of DNA because it got cut at the exact same points. Okay, Is that enough to convict somebody? Just this one test here? No. What do you do? You go back and you take a different restriction enzyme. You cut it with a different restriction enzyme that cuts at different points. You run that gel again. They should have, again, the exact same patterns because you've cut it now at a different spot. But if the um, sequences of DNA were identical, then they should always be cut into the exact same segments. You repeat this a bunch of times, and then you can have a pretty high certainty, like 99% certainty, that um, those two people are the same people, that the DNA came from the same place. Except for what Hank Green was talking about, in that it could have been your clone or your twin, because you actually do have the same DNA sequences then. Questions on that? That's it.